Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Eaton of the Dupuytren Research Group. Dr. Anna Schur of the British Dupuytren Society has posed questions about Dupuytren disease. I'm going to try to answer these and I just want to reinforce the fact that we're still in an age of profound ignorance about the basic nature of Dupuytren disease. This will change once we use the right tools. But until then, we have to resist our natural tendencies to oversimplify and to see patterns where there are none. So having said that, let's get to the questions. So our first question, what specialists should someone see for this condition? I have a strong opinion about this. With or without contracture, the first person to see is a hand surgery specialist. Now, this is for two reasons. The first is to rule out other diagnoses that are not Dupuytren. Hand surgeons have more experience than all other specialists with hand diagnoses that might be mistaken for Dupuytren. Things like tendinitis, flexor tendon sheath cysts, flexor tendon bowstringing, diabetic stiff hand syndrome, atypical mycobacterial infections, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, giant cell tumors, sarcomas, and many other conditions. Tendinitis in particular can exist in the same finger at the same time as Dupuytren, and that directly affects treatment. Hand surgeons are more familiar with these diagnoses than other specialists. The second reason is to speed up the time to get to the right diagnosis. The average new Dupuytren patient will see two or three doctors over the course of sometimes several years before getting the right diagnosis. And again, physicians who don't see and treat the entire range of hand problems may not have the range of experience to distinguish Dupuytren from similar appearing conditions. And this includes rheumatologists, radiation oncologists, internists, alternative medicine specialists. Uh, next question. Is a hand surgeon always a plastic surgeon or orthopedic? Great question, especially for Dupuytren. So anyone who operates on the hand can call themselves a hand surgeon. Orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons, general surgeons, they all get some hand surgery training in their residencies. Hand surgery specialists, however, have additional training in hand surgery after their orthopedic, plastic, or general surgery residency. This gives them crucial skills to handle difficult Dupuytren problems. Now, a hand surgeon without specialty training may have great results, especially if they don't operate on severe Dupuytren hands, and they're lucky. But that's not the question. The question is how will your surgeon handle complications and recurrence? These are both very common issues with Dupuytren. Uh, unfortunately, I know many Dupuytren patients who had a problem with their treatment. They went to their surgeon. Their surgeon said, there's nothing else that can be done when in fact there was something else that could be done, but their surgeon either didn't have the knowledge, the skills, or interest to do something else. That's something to avoid. If you're considering surgery, be an educated consumer. Ask uncomfortable questions. Where did you do your hand surgery fellowship? What will you do if my finger has no circulation at the end of your procedure? What if you straighten my finger and my contracture comes back and is much worse than I started? If they don't have a well thought out answer, if they say don't worry, if they say nothing can be done, if they say they'll refer you to a colleague, look elsewhere. See a hand surgery specialist who's interested in Dupuytren and has experience to anticipate and manage complications because that's a common issue with Dupuytren. Next question, what are the evidence-based treatments that are available for Dupuytren? Well, treatment can either be preventive or corrective. Let's start with preventive treatments. There are no evidence-based treatments for early disease because we don't yet have a way to predict today who will progress in the long term. We need a biomarker to do that. So right now, without a biomarker, these are the statistical logistics. To test a preventive treatment for Dupuytren without a biomarker, you'd need to study at least a thousand people with early disease, treat half with a preventive treatment and half with a placebo, and then see how bent their fingers are five years later. Very difficult, very expensive, and that's just for one treatment. You'd have to repeat that kind of study for every preventive treatment you wanted to test, statistically. That hasn't been done 
anywhere on this scale with any treatment, including radiotherapy. And it's a problem because Dupuytren is a chronic disease. You need to have disease biomarkers to be able to develop new preventative treatments for a chronic disease. We don't have Dupuytren biomarkers yet, but we will. Now, there is a partial workaround developed by Dr. Ilse de Grief, who's a brilliant hand surgeon in Belgium. She knew that we don't know much about the course of early Dupuytren before contracture, but we know a lot about recurrence after surgery and who's at risk for rapid recurrence. So recurrence in high-risk patients is faster and more predictable. So you don't need a thousand patients and you can have results in a year because things move fast after surgery. Dr. DeGrief uh, conducted a study in which she operated on a group of Dupuytren patients. All of them were at high risk for early recurrence after surgery. She treated half with a drug and half with a placebo and followed them for a year. The drug was tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is used to treat breast cancer. It's, it's not a chemotherapy. It blocks estrogen. But like a lot of other drugs, it does other things as well. Many effects, some of which directly affect Dupuytren biology. That's why she chose it. Tamoxifen reduced the risk of early recurrence compared to placebo. And this is huge. I, I can't emphasize that enough. This is the first proof that medicine could slow down recurrence. She repeated this study with percutaneous needle fasciotomy and showed the same effect. The problem is that tamoxifen has side effects which make it too dangerous to take in the long term. And the benefits stop once you stop taking it. Dr. Paul Binhammer in Toronto showed similar effects with cortisone shots given every three months for a year after percutaneous needle fasciotomy. Now, as long as people kept getting shots every few months, they had slower recurrence, but the benefits stopped when the shots stopped. Still huge, Dupuytren biology can be medically suppressed, but we need treatments that can be given long term, and we still need a way to test medicines on early disease without contracture, which means a biomarker. So that's preventive treatment. Not much, but very encouraging. We have a lot more data on corrective treatment, procedures to straighten bent fingers. So there are two types of corrective procedures, two groups. There's minimally invasive procedures, collagenase and needle fasciotomy, and there are open procedures, fasciectomy and dermofasciectomy. Now, overall, most people do well after either. The unsolved problem is recurrence, which is actually a prevention issue, which I just talked about. In the short term, minimally invasive procedures work about as well as open surgery to straighten fingers. Open surgery is a little better for severe contractures, but the big differences are how long the procedures last before recurrence, how long is recovery, and how risky they are. On average, fasciectomy lasts over twice as long as minimally invasive procedures. And it usually takes months to recover from open surgery compared to days to week, weeks for uh, minimally invasive procedures. The risk of permanent complications after fasciectomy is almost 10 times higher than minimally invasive procedures. And this is the rationale to start with a minimally invasive procedure as, as the first uh, treatment. Splinting does have some data. There are two studies showing that a few months of around-the-clock splinting can improve contractures, but it's unknown what happens when splinting stops. From what we know about slowly straightening fingers um, with mechanical devices like the digit widget, I'd be surprised if the gains made by splinting alone lasted after stopping the around-the-clock splinting. Uh, next question. What non-evidence-based treatments are out there and are there any worth trying in your opinion? Well, most everything else is non-evidence-based, including some things that are commonly used because either they just seem logical or because there's a tradition of using them. So one of these is hand therapy and splinting. There's no question in my mind that Hand therapy helps many people cope with recovery from Dupuytren procedures. The specifics of what that help is are, are difficult to quantify. A half a dozen well-conducted, randomized, prospective, controlled, scientific studies by different groups in different countries 
showed no long-term benefit of hand therapy and splinting after open Dupuytren surgery, and one even showed worse results with aggressive splinting compared to gentle splinting. The problem is not that these don't work. I believe they do. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence that they help some patients. The problem is that without a biomarker, we can't predict which patients might benefit and which won't. Uh, so this is my opinion. Uh, but remember, I'm not your doctor. If your doctor prescribes hand therapy or splinting, give it a try. But listen to your body's signals. Splints and therapy should not be painful. If it hurts while you're doing it, if it makes you sore the next day, then it may just be provoking inflammation, which you don't want. If you really don't think that it's helping, take a one-week therapy holiday. Start again if you feel that you need it. That's my opinion. <clears throat> what about radiotherapy? Well, here's some context. The firm lumps or nodules in Dupuytren are made of living cells. These cells can be killed by low-dose radiation. So at least half the time, radiation makes nodules smaller and less inflamed. The strings or cords in Dupuytren are collagen. They don't have many cells in them, and radiation doesn't have any beneficial effect on cords. So it's only a consideration before people develop cords and contractures. And Dupuytren is a systemic disease. So cells killed by radiation can be replaced by cells that come in through the bloodstream. Patients can develop contractures despite radiation. How effective is radiation as a preventive treatment? Well, we don't know because of the obstacles testing preventive treatments that I've talked about. We can't test who with early disease might or might not benefit from radiation. So my opinion is that if you are proactive and want to try, knowing it might or might not change your long-term outcome and that complications are rare but not zero, it's your choice. But first, see a hand surgery specialist to confirm the diagnosis and there's nothing else going on. If you don't like risk, wait until we have better data. Cortisone shots, very similar situation as radiation. Cortisone shots can help nodules. Patients can develop contractures despite prior cortisone shots. And if there is a contracture, you should avoid cortisone shots unless they're given along with some type of finger straightening procedure. Um, massage. There's no good study on the long-term effect of massage or manual treatments on Dupuytren progression or recurrence. Uh, from what we know about Dupuytren biology and problems with splinting, there's a potential risk that aggressive massage might aggravate Dupuytren. So my opinion is, if you want to try gentle massage, it'll probably make your hands feel better. Uh, can't hurt, might help, no evidence. Um, well, we know that mechanical stress is a factor in Dupuytren and that heavy manual activities at work or sports slightly increase the chance of Dupuytren. So in theory, avoiding heavy strenuous manual activities or protecting your hands with gloves during heavy handwork might protect them from aggravating Dupuytren biology by whatever you're doing, in theory. Um, supplements. There are a few contenders based on what we know about Dupuytren and the biology of fibrosis. So antifibrotic compounds such as N-acetylcysteine, which is in onions and small amounts in a number of foods, quercetin, which is in buckwheat, which is also known as kasha, and it's also in capers, uh, sulforaphane, which is in broccoli and cauliflower, and caffeine, which is in pretty much everything I drink, um, are all in theory helpful, but no human studies exist. They're all available as nutritional supplements, and they're all pretty well tolerated, so you could try those. Topical formulations with calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil, may help Peroni disease, but there's no evidence that they work for Dupuytren, and more importantly, whether they penetrate the thick skin of the palm. There's no evidence that they work for Lederhose, although they're sold for that. I'm not very enthusiastic about them. I'd be happy to be proven wrong. 
Uh, next question, how can a patient decide a long-term treatment plan? Is there a decision pathway they can follow? Well, this is a crucial question because the biggest problem with Dupuytren is not the details of one treatment. It's the problem that it's a chronic disease which often needs a series of treatments. Each additional treatment has a risk of additional permanent complications. Repeat procedures have an even greater risk of complications than the first procedure. Repeat procedures may not work as well as the first procedure, so you'd like to avoid them. If someone has many procedures over their lifetime, they progressively have more and more permanent complications and less and less hand function. That's what we'd like to avoid. Knowing this, Dr. Ilsa de Grief wrote what I think is the real goal of Dupuytren care, which is to minimize the number of permanent complications from Dupuytren disease and from its treatment over the lifetime of the patient. So how do we do that? Well, one strategy is to start with minimally invasive treatments. They have the lowest complication rate. Over their lifetime, one or two minimally invasive procedures might be all that's needed for a person with mild Dupuytren biology. For a person with more treatment-resistant disease, minimally invasive treatments might not be the final answer, but they might buy time before a bigger procedure is needed. Um, open procedures, fasciectomy is the most common, dermafasciectomy is more extensive, removing skin and, re and replacing it with a skin graft. Dermafasciectomy lasts longer than fasciectomy, but it changes the hand more. So complications are more common with repeat procedures. Certain people are more prone to recurrence and to having to have multiple procedures. People who develop disease younger than 50 who have close family members with disease, who have knuckle pads, letter hose, three or more fingers or digits involved, and other factors. Together, these factors are called Dupuytren diathesis or diathesis factors. People with, with diathesis, one could argue to have dermofasciectomy as the first open surgery to minimize the risk of multiple procedures. For people without these risk factors, fasciectomy is the most reasonable first open surgery with dermofasciectomy as the fallback. So, next question. Is it possible to predict the likely progression of disease for a specific patient, not without a biomarker? We know that people with diathesis are more likely to recur after a corrective procedure, but it's still not known whether diathesis affects the rate of progression before treatment starts. Very difficult thing to study. We'll get figures on it at some point. Next question. What factors do you take into account when assessing and advising patients? Treatment outcomes depend on two independent factors, how bent the joints are and diathesis factors. So how bent the joints are affects treatment results early on. The more bent the joints, the less likely they are to be fully straightened. And the more likely they are to lose ground early in recovery before they plateau at their final post-treatment angle. The window for the best outcomes is between about 20 and 40 degrees for the bend in, in the PIP joint. At less than 20 degrees, the improvement really doesn't justify taking the risk of a procedure. At more than 40 degrees, tendon damage can prevent a good result. You have a little bit more wiggle room for the MCP joint. Uh, 50 degrees is a pretty common recommendation to stop waiting and have a corrective procedure, although you can do it earlier than that. So that's how the, the degree of bend affects treatment. Diathesis factors don't affect initial outcomes. They predict recurrence and long-term treatment resistance. Now, treatment resistance means that the disease remains active after treatment. Contractures come back and just keep getting worse. They don't plateau. So diathesis affects the decision to do dermofasciectomy rather than fasciectomy as the first open procedure. Uh, question. What facts should patients keep in mind if they are worried about the future? Well, first, don't panic. The unpredictability of Dupuytren means that you might do much better than you think. Uh, here are the numbers. For, for people that have just developed a nodule, over the next 10 years, you have a 1 in 10 chance that the nodule will go away without any treatment. That's the problem of studying preventive treatments. There's a 2 in 10 chance that it'll progress and you'll need a corrective procedure. So that's 2 in 10, 1 in 5 chance of needing some kind of procedure at some time in 10 years after the first nodule. The remaining three quarters of people 
will either have no change or won't progress enough to need a procedure in the 10 years which follow the first appearance of a nodule. So the overall outlook is actually pretty favorable for most people. I've been watching my first Dupuytren nodule since it popped up about six years ago. So far, little change. Here's hoping. The next thing is to investigate your surgeons and establish a relationship. Connect early with a hand surgery specialist who has a personal interest in Dupuytren. See them on a regular basis, once or twice a year, even if there's no change. So they get to know you and they get to know your version of disease. They'll be a much better resource for it. And I guess the last thing is support research. The basic treatment model hasn't changed in 200 years. Wait for a bent finger, treat the bent finger, ignore everything else about the disease, and then repeat as needed until either you or your surgeon says no more. That's got to change, and the only way it will is if we all work together. And a shameless plug, enroll in the International Dupuytren Data Bank, dupestudy.com. This is a free longitudinal natural history and biomarker discovery study. The more people who enroll, the faster we can find the key to better treatments and outcomes for everyone who suffers from Dupuytren disease. And that's it. So thanks, Anna, for asking these questions, and uh, stay well.